The following interview was conducted with Maurice Rapport for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, October the 14th uh, in uh, 2008 in the Stewart Center, Purdue University's uh, television studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and your siblings in your early years. Well, I, I was born, in, uh, as I later found out, in Brooklyn, New York. And um, I moved between New York and Atlantic City from the time I was born, 1919, until 1928, because there were some difficulties my mother was having with my father, and they were never fully resolved. And so I was living with my mother and, and her parents, in, sometimes in Atlantic City, sometimes in New York but finally in New York. Mm -hmm. Do you have any I, brothers or sisters? I have a sister who is about a year and a half older than I. And she was a charming child. And I felt that I was unappealing. Because my memories of my father were unpleasant. And I later learned that he was a very good father to the daughter of his second marriage. Mm, okay. Where was early school? Where did you go to school in your in the grade I, schools? I went to school in, partly in Atlantic City and partly in uh, in New York, mostly in New York, and from 1928 on in New York in the Bronx. Okay, is that where you went to high school? I went to Debut Clinton High School in the Bronx. Okay, tell us a little bit about high school. What student organizations and what sort of classes you took? Well, the I think my. My wisest decision was in the second year of high school when I decided to be a chemist. And uh, I had enormous difficulty in the first couple of weeks with chemistry because there was something I didn't understand. And so I pursued the teacher after class and she answered the question and suddenly it was all clear to me. And so I began to work very hard to teach other students about chemistry and I ran to chemistry help classes and activities of that kind and so I got into the Arista quite early. Mm -hmm. And uh, were, you, were there any student organizations, any clubs that you belonged to while you were there? I Was there a chemistry club? Or there was a chemistry club, club. Uh -huh. I was a member of that, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, All right. And I, I tried out for the math club but uh, found out that I wasn't capable of matching the other brilliant members. Okay, all right. Tell us then after, when, when year did you graduate from high school and then what came next, college? Well, in, in, in high school was a, a, they had special classes for the brighter students and I was in competition with someone who was probably brighter than I, but I was second to him all through until the seventh year, somebody from New Jersey came in and displaced me. It was one of my great disappointments. <laughs> and I was moved down to third. And in classes in which he attended, he wasn't that smart. <laughs> but uh, I graduated uh, third in my class from Dewitt Clinton, I think it was 1936. Okay. And I felt that I was bright enough that I should have not have to go to the city college. And I had hoped that my that my record in the Regents examinations would get me a scholarship to uh, Rensselaer Polytech, but that didn't work. And uh, so I, I, I enlisted in Cooper Union, and that was a, a com competitive, and I apparently did fairly well. But in the year at Cooper Union, I couldn't make it. I, I forget what it was. I did well in chemistry, but not in math and some of the other courses. Mm -hmm. So I transferred to City College. They tried desperately, I think, almost to get me to stay. And I told them I just couldn't make it. I was working four o'clock in the morning and hear the milkman come. And I, and I wasn't able to uh, master some of the courses. So I went to City College where I did very well and graduated with my class. And, and was a member of Phi Beta Kappa. Okay. How large was your uh, uh, the class in college? How large was your graduating class approximately? Big pardon? 
How large was your graduating class from City College? It was a pretty good there size. Were, there were, it was large. There were 200 chemists. It was that large. My. Where was City College located at then? It was located in, uh, in Upper Manhattan, okay. around 145th Street, down to 137th Street. Mm -hmm. And it's in almost the Harlem area at the present time, and we had to go occasionally through the Harlem area mm -hmm. if we were uh, late at leaving school. Sure, okay. Were there any student, uh, when you were in college, any student clubs that you belonged to? No, there wasn't time for that. I, okay. I always, I, because of my transfer, I w and, and the method they have of registering for chemistry classes, all of the classes I wanted were closed before I could get to them. And so it turned out in my final year, I was going to classes for 48 hours during the week. How was that? How did that occur? I, I was able to get the chemistry classes finally. And you took a whole lot of and them. And they all piled up, and they were laboratory classes. So it was kind of a dizzying affair, you can imagine, with, with that many hours of class in addition to the homework. Right. Were you working while you were in, in uh, college? I was working at, at the, I think it was called the NYA at the time, uh, NY something or other, it was an assistance. Okay. Uh, and I was working for, um, in biochemistry, for a man, uh, Ernest Borick, who was uh, not only teaching at City College, but he was working at uh, Psychiatric Institute, New York State Psychiatric Institute, for a man named uh, Heinrich Welch. So I had a contact through that, and that developed later on. Oh, that's good. Then after, what happened after college? What was next? Did you go to graduate school? Well, I happened to not, we hadn't quite finished our work at the end of the year, and so we were working in the laboratory when a call came in from Rockefeller Institute. They were looking for technicians. And I and this other fellow went down and, and applied, and we formed a club of people who failed to get into Rockefeller. And, and then I would, two weeks later, I received a notice that I had been appointed to be a technician for Joseph Fruton at the Rockefeller Institute. Well, very nice. What did that, what was the job, what did that entail, being the technician? Uh, the, the job, uh, and they, at the time, they were really working on, on the structure of, uh, of proteins, and they had developed a very important contribution, which was the specificity of enzymes using small peptides. And so I would be making measurements of the degradation of the peptides and the other work that was required mm -hmm. in that line of work. And Dr. Fruton was a, was a tough person to work for. Okay, but you enjoyed what you were doing though. When I finally found out how to handle him, I enjoyed what I was doing. <laughs> when you got a working relationship, huh? <laughs> it, was, it was hard, but you know, uh, it, it, it was interesting that uh, I was able to break the ice by bringing in some political material that he was interested in. <laughs> interested in. Okay. And then I overdid it, and he told me not to bring that <laughs> in any longer. <laughs> <laughs> Stick with the work, right? <laughs> oh dear. Well, then what what came next after? Well, you were there I had, employed for two years, you said? I had wanted to, uh, I, I was there for a year and a half, and I had wanted to go to graduate school, and I had mentioned that to them. And, and, and somebody was coming through from, from Caltech, and, uh, and I prepared in my best clothing, and I was introduced to him. And it turns out he gave a lecture in which they were dissatisfied with his topic, his, his, his method of uh, synthesizing peptides or proteins involved ATP and they didn't think that was correct. And so that whole thing fell through. <laughs> and it was a great disappointment. But I had learned that another technician who had been there some time, they had kept him on because they liked his services and they didn't encourage him to leave. But in, in my case, they suddenly were very active and, 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 and they were very decent about it. And they, they got me uh, an appointment at an introduction to, to Caltech, where somebody who had been in that department 
uh, Carl Neiman had, had become a, a, a professor in the department. At the Rockefeller. Campus. And when they asked me where I, I was going, and I, I told them I was going to California because my mother was there and, and, my, and my grandparents were there now, and so I would have a place to stay, and I didn't have any money. And so the, when they said, well, who will you work for? And I mentioned a person at UCLA, at UCLA, and they said, oh, you can't work for him. <laughs> they were really very prejudiced about things like this. And so they got me the appointment at Caltech. And so I used what money I had to get, to pay for one ter semester's uh, uh, education at the at Caltech. instruction at Caltech. Okay. And then the, and the, at that time, uh, this was December of 1941, and you know the war broke out in the beginning, and so I left at the end of December and went to Caltech on January the 1st. And, and then after the, the one semester of instruction, then we all had to go on war work of one kind or another. And so I was enlisted in the program on, on the synthesis of anti-malarials. Okay. You were not, uh, what about the draft? You were not eligible for the draft or? I, I had bad eyesight and so I was in 3A. Three, three okay. So I wasn't immediately eligible for the draft. Okay. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the project that you were working with. And you were taking classes at the same time? Yes, we were taking classes at the same time. And, and the classes were rather difficult because the... Uh, this was during the war now. It was right. during the war. Right. And the professors, when they gave the qualifying examinations, if you didn't pass, you had to wait a whole year to take the next one. So that it was kind of important to, uh, if you were going to get through in a reasonable period of time, to pass those examinations. And, and the, the people in the laboratory in which I worked were really very brilliant. They had a valedictorian from Harvard and a mm -hmm. salutatorian from Yale and so on. So it was quite interesting. I learned a lot from them. Mm -hmm. And the anti-malarial program w was basically non-contributory because the tests of the compounds, we were making compounds. And the compounds were tested on on a duck malaria and, and, and some chick malaria, and, and those drugs were never useful in humans. But that was the program. And I eventually wrote my thesis on this, on the synthesis of these compounds. Okay, all right. And you got, both, did you go, start for the master's and then went on for the PhD at Caltech? Uh, this was the PhD program. Okay. They didn't have a master's program okay. so that I recall. Through. Mm -hmm. that I recall. Okay. When, and when did you receive your degree? And then tell us what went on next. Um, I got married in, uh, in my first year at Caltech. Okay. In, uh, in Ju July of 1942. I, I moved up my, I was one of the few people they had who ever moved up their final examination date, <laughs> which was scheduled for December, and I took it in November. And uh, and then we went on our honeymoon, <laughs> and and I passed it, and I passed it. I had to. I had. I had a professor on the examination committee, who was very nasty, and I had Linus Pauling on the committee, who was rather strict, and I had to fake him out. It was interesting. He wanted to know, did I know the bond lengths for the various combinations of, of atoms, and I knew all of them but one. So I, I gave the ones that I knew very slowly, and he said, that's enough. <laughs> very <laughs> clever. <laughs> Good planning. <laughs> yes. Good planning. <laughs> oh, and then you passed, and then what transpired after that? Well, while I was at Caltech, in August, um, Irvin Page was going around. Uh, he had just been appointed research director at, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, and he was recruiting people. And, and, and I was introduced to him as an organic chemist, which is what I think he was looking for. And, uh, and I was supposed to be finishing at the end of that fall, fall in December. And, and then he, uh, it turned out that I had been a technician at Rockefeller, and he had worked at Rockefeller, so there was a connection there.
And so he pursued me. He wrote me several times, thought I was finished by now, and when would I be ready to come? And, and so uh, I had looked into the matter, and I had a friend uh, there who, who knew him and said it wouldn't be a wise choice uh, to go to work with him. So I explored that further. I went to see Gordon Allies, who had invented benzedrine, and he said, well, he didn't think he was that bad. And then he said, and you'll find that your ability to get along with people is as important or even more important than the work that you do. And I took that as a very important lesson and have followed it the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. okay. And so I came back east looking for jobs, and I looked for one in Philadelphia. I looked for one at Sloan Kettering, because I wanted to be in New York, where my wife was involved with her mother, who had become ill. And uh, they didn't have a job opening until March. And so I then wrote to Paige and said that if he would stake me to an airplane ride, I would come to work in Cleveland. Okay, okay. And he did, and I went there. Okay. And your wife, your wife, you settled in Cleveland then? Yes, but it turned out that uh, my wife was very unhappy with me. And, uh, and when I came back to New York, she told me about her displeasure, and I said, it's okay, uh, I'll do whatever you want, support you in any way you want, but come back to Cleveland with me because I'm just starting out and a little bit afraid of what I had to do. Mm -hmm. So she did, and we settle down in Cleveland. Yeah, okay, good. Now tell us a little about, then go on, uh, what your work at the Cleveland Clinic was next. Well, it turned out that at the Cleveland Clinic, he didn't have anything, any project in mind for me. He had no, no suggestions to make. But I later learned that one of the problems he was concerned with was the serum vasoconstrictor for the, for the main reason that his thesis, he was really concerned with dealing with uh, essential hypertension. And, and he was working on it from two standpoints. There's a malignant form, and he had Arta Green, who was a very well-known physical biochemist he had recruited. And she was assaying some kidney extracts that were apparently partially successful in a patient they had with this disorder. And so I learned about the serum vasoconstrictor and it was an unsolved problem, and he was interested in it because he thought that hypertension was a result of increased peripheral resistance due to vasoconstrictors in serum, and this one was known, and any time you took a specimen of blood, you got this artifact that prevented you from looking for the real vasoconstrictors that might be responsible for the disorder. And in addition to that, he was using as an assay a, a rabbit ear perfusion system, and that had been attacked by Landis at Harvard as being a useless method. He had put it in a box, and Landis had said, if you open the box, you get results, and that was quite incorrect. So using, justifying the use of that rabbit ear preparation was also of interest to Page. Hmm. And so they had this assay set up that was being run by by uh, Arta Green, and so the assay system was in place, and it was a question of working on the on the substance. But Page had no suggestions of how to even get started, and I got some blood from the slaughterhouse in a pickle jar, and it, it, and it clots, and you can't get at it after it clots, except digging it out with your hands. And I realized that wasn't going to be successful. So I had to invent a, a way of getting large amounts, because I thought this problem would require processing large amounts of, uh, of blood. And, and, and it put a great deal of emphasis on the efficiency of the method, because there was indication in the literature that there might be more than one substance involved. So I had to do this work so that I was recovering almost all the activity through each of the steps. So the initial step was one that uh, just involved precipitating proteins with alcohol, and then you had to remove the alcohol. And there were a, sex, a, a succession of steps that, that uh, was, was published, and it turned out that at every step, 
the material you had was unstable. So there was no place you could stop to collect a lot of material until the final step, the fifth step. And, and the fifth step was a miracle step. The miracle step in that along the purification, the most serious obstacle was urea that was present in the blood. And no matter what you did, you couldn't separate the urea from the other materials. So I said, you'd have to have some kind of precipitation step that didn't precipitate the urea and would give you the activity. And I had taken with me from, it turns out that at, in, in the laboratory at Caltech, the, the synthesis of antimalarials got to be very boring. You know, there was no reward system in success of the compounds we were making. And the system was such that we would send materials to the analyst and she would get the wrong answer. And we knew that what the compounds were, most of the time you know what you're making. So we have to keep sending them back until she got the right answer. The whole system was very uh, un unrewarding. And so I, I looked around for something to do. We had a large cabinet with chemicals and, and it was overloaded. So I thought I would, if you looked at the bottles, you could see a lot of them were almost empty and you could transfer them to a smaller bottle and make room for them. And they had worked in 1940 on a compound, 5-nitrobarbituric acid, that had been useful for precipitating all kinds of amine compounds. And so when I transferred this material from this bottle, there was some left over and I said, well, we were all kind of envious of the head of the laboratory when we were all making these synthetic compounds and he had been assigned the job, he was a senior man in the lab, of, of determining the structure of some byproduct of, of quinine in, in rabbit metabolism. So we were all kind of envious of, of, that, of that kind of activity. And I said I might have that kind, come up against that kind of problem. So I took this sample of 5 nitrobarbituric acid with me. And so the various precipitating agents, the one that uh, was the most useful quality to this was that it made, formed an extremely insoluble magnesium salt. So you could get rid of the precipitating agent, agent easily. So I, I used this and I got this heavy precipitate and it turns out the heavy precipitate was 95% the, the, the ammonium salt of 5-nitrobarbituric acid. And, and, and it was an interesting compound because at that stage, the activity was completely precipitated and was quite stable. You could recrystallize this material and you could make it get large crystals or small crystals. It made no difference. The activity remained constant. And, and Page had made a mistake earlier of, of precipitating the sodium salt or, or the uh, uh, precipitating his the man he was working with, Helmer, had precipitated the thing he was working on was called angiotonin at the time. And they had gotten this precipitate and claimed they had isolated it. And it turned out all they had was the pick rate of sodium salt that they had used as a precipitant. So I said, you have to be careful that what you've got is what you're looking for and not something else. Now it turns out that that 5-nitrobarbituric acid is, is not only able to precipitate amines and apparently a lot of ammonium salts. And I had used, in the isolation work, I had used the ammonium sulfate to break emulsions. You know, to break an emulsion, you have to s load it up with salts of some kind. And you can get more sodium, ammonium sulfate than any other kind of salt into the solution. And I used that on two occasions, once to break emulsions and the other in order to push most of the activity into the butanol layer. So there was a great deal of ammonium sulfate in the final step in which the precipitation occurred. And it turns out that nitrobarbituric acid, I just recently looked it up, and it also precipitates creatinine. So it turned out the miracle in this step is that what came out of the ammonium, the ammonium deleterate precipitate was something that involved the serum vasoconstrictor and creatinine and sulfate. So the problem was then how do you get the material you're looking for from that precipitate? And when I removed it with magnesium, 
I lost half the activity. So I said, I can't do that. So I went in and told Pays I can't solve this problem. And he was very gentle, and he said, okay, try something else, maybe you have better luck. I thought it was quite remarkable. He, had, he, hadn't made, he hadn't really been interested in any aspect of the science up to that point anyway. So I was in, in, involved in, in getting a job in New York, and I was writing to, it turns out that Heinrich Wells, who I had known, and, and Disher had applied for, a jo- uh, applied for a grant to work on nucleic acids in the brain. And they were going to hire me, but they didn't get the grant. So uh, that job didn't open up, and, uh, and they found somebody, Carl Meyer, who was also looking for somebody, and so they had introduced me to him. Well, while I was in New York, I think perhaps to discuss the job, I came back, and in the Rick Cold Room, saw that in one of the tubes in which I had been working, there was a little crystal of the material I was looking for, a little cluster. And I realized I could solve this problem. So I then was able, by using these different techniques, when I told Paige that I couldn't solve it, I was then free to try anything that wasn't logical. It was any kind of, in isolation work, it doesn't really require intellect. It's just, as I always described it, it's a, it's a it's a strong back and a weak mind you need for this kind of work. And so in the course of trying this, I dissolved this material up in water and precipitated it with acetone, and lo and behold, they got the crystals of the pure material. No, no, they got the, they got the, 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 pre- the precipitate was all the ammonium salt of dilatoric acid, and all of the activity was in the acetone layer. So when I evaporated that down, I got the crystals have turned out to be, uh, on analysis, it, it eventually turned out to be serotonin uh, combined with creatinine and sulfate. And it turned out the analysis said there were five nitrogens in this compound. There was no way to determine its structure with that degree of complexity in something that contains an indole nucleus, which I had already established, which is a story in itself. And so, I told, I, and by the way, when I, sent, when I sent the sample for analysis, it was March the 1st of 1948, and it changed my life. It changed my life because I had found out by that time that the way scientists tear other scientists down is with the simple question, what has he ever done? And I had done something. <laughs> and I was, I was flying. As I say, I, I, I describe this as having been born at that moment. I attended my own birth. And then I realized that's not the end of the story. You have to find out what it is. Because knowing that you've gotten something pure isn't, isn't the answer. The answer is to make these things available in some way. And so I, since I didn't respect Paige, uh, and he said he will turn it over to drug companies to find out what it was. Uh, I left Cleveland, and I went to New York to work with Carl Meyer, who, when I met him on the train going to Atlantic City, and told me, he said, well, that's an interesting problem, but if you work with me, you're not allowed to work on this compound. Well, I went to New York, and it turned out that he had a heart attack, and he was in the hospital for six weeks, and so I continued to work on this problem. Well, there were were keys to this problem that slowly got put into place. One was that when I had the pure material, Arthur Green, who was a physical chemist, and I normally would have done uh, a a simple titration, which would give you the molecular weight. She said, no, you have to get the complete titration curve. And she showed me how to do that. I had to invent a little vessel so I could go to to higher pHs without destroying the material. And when we did that, it turned out there was a specific uh, ionization constant at at around 4.6, which turned out to be characteristic of creatinine. So that was one step. The question was then, was the creatinine bound to this other material, or was it free in some way? That was one problem. The other problem was that I had a, 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 
I had a, a, a UV absorption curve of the material, and I had taken it to pH 10.5, it was unchanged. I decided at one point to go higher. I went to 11.5, and a new peak appeared, which meant there was another grouping in there. And, and also the way I had been following this co material colorimetrically said there had to be some kind of phenolic group so that there was a, 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 another, uh, an accounting for the, for the analysis, there was another hydroxyl group present. So that, in, in a sense, said that there's another hydroxyl group present, and, and there's creatinine, and I was still didn't know how to deal with this. And at night, I used to go through literature generally. To, uh, I had been successful doing this once before that got me onto the indole structure. Uh, I, I should tell you the story that, that in, in the course of, of the isolation work, at one point, Page did make a suggestion. He said, why don't you just try different, different precipitating agents and see if something works? So I tried various things and nothing, seemed to, nothing would work. You can't get it to work until you have a high enough concentration mm -hmm. of the material you're looking for. But one of the tubes was colored, the one with, in which I had used gold chloride. And I, I interpreted that, the, that the, the coloration, which slowly deposited the material, was a reduction of the gold. And I said, I went around trying to find out where do you get information on what causes this? And I went to Case to talk to people in, in Western Reserve. Nobody could give me any hints about it. So I used to, when it, it's very frustrating to work on an isolation problem when there, there's no reward system involved. You have to create a reward system. The one I created was I would wash the dishes and look at them at the end of the day and said, at least I did that. And, and, and so in this, this is a, a, a I, was, I would get all the literature on people who had worked on the serum phase of constrictor and I'd look through it to see if there were any possible hints. And in the course of doing this, I saw that uh, the great British biochemist who had discovered tryptophan had worked out the structure of tryptophan incorrectly. He had a scathole structure instead of an indole structure. So I said, well, how did he make this mistake? You go through this literature and find out that everything he did was correct, in spite of the fact that the interpretation was wrong. There was no way of knowing this. But in the, the last page, uh, there's an article that he says that this tryptophan has exquisitely able to reduce gold salts. <laughs> <laughs> so that, was, that's, that led me to the indole structure. So that was the key to, par to part of the structure. That, and, and in the characterization that I published with Page, all of this information was available. Anyway, so I had more things that had to be put into place. I, I, I used to go through these Harvey lectures. And in the course of the Harvey lecture, there was a, an article by a, by a pediatrician who was studying uh, 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 babies. And to study babies' urine output, you measured their, their, uh, their output of creatinine in order to get an idea of what the, of what the daily output is. It's kind of difficult when they're peeing into diapers, you know. And they, and they would precipitate the creatinine as the, as the pick rate. But in the course of this, he mentioned that there was another method he also used, the Benedict method. So I looked up the Benedict method, and it turned out the Benedict method could exquisitely differentiate creatinine and other compounds like it from one another from the kind of color they gave. So that meant there was a, a chance here to find out whether the creatinine was bound chemically or was not. So on a very small amount of material, I did this test, and it turned out that the rate of color development and the color yield were with up 90% of creatinine. So the creatinine was present as creatinine. That was three of the nitrogens, only two nitrogens left. So the problem was now how to make the assignment. Well, I persuaded uh, 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 Ed Maynard in pharmacology to synthesize, try to synthesize the material.
and we made the five methoxy derivative and hoped we could cleave the methyl group, but there wasn't enough time to do this. But from the absorption spectrum of the five methoxy compound, it was quite clear that the hydroxyl group, the phenolic hydroxyl group, had to be in the five position. So now, the, to, 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 to complete the structure, you needed to, it was a case of working on the assignment of the other molecules that were in the, that were in the analysis to satisfy the analysis. And in order to satisfy the analysis of the, of the, of the what turned out to be serotonin and creatinine sulfate, you had to add a water of crystallization. That's a kind of fudge factor, but it does exist. And it helps you account for the analysis in order to get integral values for the atoms. So there was a problem of an additional oxygen coming from the water to satisfy the molecule. Now it turns out that that there were two difficulties involved here. The main compound that people were concerned about in this, this work were pe mo molecules like epinephrine or adrenaline and noradrenaline, norepinephrine, were extremely active in maintaining blood pressure. And in their structures, these were, these were uh, uh, dihydroxy or catechol structures, and the side chain had a hydroxyl group in it. Hydroxyl group in the side chain. So the question was, was, was I dealing with something with a hydroxyl group in the side chain, or was it the hydroxyl group coming from the water? And another problem was I had worked out a test where any amine, if you heated it with ninhydrin and sodium acetate, you got a nice red or blue color. The serotonin creatinine sulfate didn't give that. So it said it, it didn't look like a primary amine. Well, the next step was you had to get some kind of confirmation. And, and if I took a large, a fairly large amount, nine milligrams of the material I had, and precipitated with, with, with picric acid, there were two kinds of crystals that developed. Most rapidly, the red one, and then more slowly, a yellow one. And, and so I carefully separated these by hand after I dried them, and sent the serotonin picrate or for analysis. I persuaded the Department of Medicine, when I was working with Carl Meyer, to stake me to the analysis. It cost 23 bucks. I was not willing to put my own money into it. And the analysis came back, and it was incorrect for the expectation until I put back a water of crystallization. So I was still confronted with the oxygen. And this material had been very, very carefully dried because of my concern about this. So when I had to guess the structure, I had to override the possibilities. And I published the, uh, the formulation of the active principle as 5-hydroxytryptamine. That turned out to be the key step to the whole development of a large field. In the first place, it was a new compound of one that people had been studying extensively as norepinephrine, epinephrine. And, uh, and immediately, three companies were interested in synthesizing it. They uh, eventually turned out there, there were two here in the United States, and that's a big story in itself, Upjohn and, and Abbott and, 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 and uh, Farm Italia in Italy. Of course, it turned out that there was an Italian, Erst Bomber, who had been working on a material found in, in, in the intestine that had certain staining properties, and he also found it in, uh, in the posterior glands of the octopus, and he, was, and he had studied, he was a pharmacologist. Of course, actually, this is a, a, a problem in pharmacology to determine the, uh, what some particular activity does, what is its function. So the uh, Upjohn people approached me in around uh, May of 1950, and they said to me, how can we help you? I said, well, I wrote them a letter in June, and I said, I guess 
even though Ed Maynard and I are working on the synthesis, uh, I don't think we're going to have time to work on it, so why don't you just see if it, it's the right structure? Well, it turned out they had already done that. <laughs> they were dishonest. I wrote them a letter in June, and they had been working on it since April. <laughs> and uh, because it's obviously something uh, that could be of enormous importance in medicine. So th these companies made it, and it, and it turned out the Upjohn people, when, they, with the, when I gave them some of the natural product, and they were able to identify it basically through correspondence, I think 29 peaks in the infrared. Uh, they had a, a, a identified, and they were so excited, they invited me to, to Kalamazoo uh, to tell me about this result, and they said, we'll publish it with you. You can take some mixed melting points and, and be on the paper. And, uh, and it was really a very exciting time. I had been going to a meeting in Chicago and I had to drive to Kalamazoo. And, and, and then it turned out that they didn't do anything. It was all very slow. They, and, and at the end of, uh, at the end of almost 1951, I had rumors that there was another company working on this, Abbott, and that they should uh, get off the dime. So they did. They wrote a paper, and they tried to get it into science. They said it would take six, six months. So they sent a letter to the American Journal of American Chemical Society on the identification of the serum vasoconstrictor, and now they left my name off it. And when I complained about that, uh, I was not successful. And it turned out they were still slow, that Abbott had, their, had a paper in that same journal in October, and their paper didn't come out till November. But Abbott did not have, uh, did not have the natural product, so they had not really identified the serum vasoconstrictor. The Upjohn people had, and most of the literature doesn't discuss this correctly. So uh, the Abbott people then wrote to me uh, and asked, "Would I take mixed melting points of the material to see if there was an, a possible identification?" And eventually I told them it really, it, it didn't work out with the melt, mixed melting points, so they got a pure product. And then I said, it really doesn't pay you to do this because Upjohn has got a solid identification. So there it was. And it was a, pharma, it was a pharmacological problem, a new substance of this kind. And what does it do? Well, the initial work was, uh, I, as a matter of fact, I, I uh, it was known in the Department of Medicine. They asked me to give a talk on it, which I did in, uh, in I think, in November of 1950, before the synthesis had been described. And they told me not to reveal the fact that the material was available synthetically. And I gave this talk, and the the, the uh, Gilman, who was the head of the Department of Pharmacology, said, "We won't know what this thing does until we see what it does in cats." So I eventually did the pharmacology on cats. And what happens is that pharmacology cannot give you function. Pharmacology permits you to test on various techniques available to pharmacologists, isolated muscle strips or blood pressure measurements. And, uh, and comparison with the substances that have these effects. And it turns out that nothing was decisive. So you couldn't say what serotonin did. And after 18 years, I went to a meeting and a friend approached me and he said, you know, serotonin doesn't do anything. Because more pharmacology had been done by that time the picture was still very unsettled. There were lots of things that it did, but nothing that was, it was decisive enough. And, and the review of, of what possible functions were uh, are, are summarized in the review that Erstbommer wrote and, and other people discussed in their papers. But the immediate structure of serotonin as an indole, immediately tied it to LSD. Because LSD by that time was in 
use for four or five years. And it was a, a, a created hallucinations. And so it obviously is involving brain function in some way. And so they're immediately latched onto the relationship of serotonin to brain, structure, brain function. And, and the latch, in, 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 in the pharmacologist's attempt to do this only resulted in finally showing that serotonin was present in the brain. That connection was made in several ways. But the, the contact with LSD was all important, and Woolley tried to use this as an explanation for, for brain malfunction and possibly as a basis for schizophrenia and other mental disorders. And funny, at that particular time, I got a call from Heinrich Welsh, and he said, Woolley's trying to get you the Nobel Prize. <laughs> well, none of this stuff worked out. And it took another, at 18 years, at 30 years, there was still nothing decisive about its function in brain. Although by that time, it was, there were drugs that were beginning to be useful, and mainly in depression. And, and it was finally developed that Prozac turned out to be very useful in this disorder. Now, what was the problem? The problem is if something can work in too many places, you can't get a decisive picture of its working in one place. So the problem of using drugs is that you don't get the high degree of specificity you need to pinpoint function. And it turns out as late as 1980, Seven. The first meeting of the Serotonin Club was carried out was in Heron Island in uh, Queensland, Australia. I was not a member of that meeting, and the people guessed on on how many receptors there were for serotonin, and they ranged from one to ten, and the highest number was ten. Well, it's now fourteen. And the receptors are grouped into seven categories. And the receptors don't even work directly. They work through secondary functions. So for example, it turns out that one of these groups decreases. It turns out that the receptor activates a second messenger. So that one of these groups activates uh, or deactivates, decreases the amount of, uh, of ad adenylcyclase. A second group activates adenylcyclase. As a matter of fact, there were about five different ones that are activate adenylcyclase. Uh, one group activates a protein kinase A, which goes to another set of and, and the other final group acts directly on, on, uh, the, on the membrane pores to allow ions to go through. So you have 14 different possible changes that occur in the cells that have these receptors on them. And the whole system using serotonin is fairly well localized in the midbrain, what are called uh, the raphae nuclei. And they spread out and connect to many parts of the brain. So that using drugs, you don't get decisive pictures because of the multiple interactions. And at the present time, it's going far beyond that because it turns out that Not a single transmitter is involved in these processes. At the same time that serotonin transmitter is involved, norepinephrine may be involved and dopamine may be involved. 
And so the picture of the complexity of brain function is something that's still far in the future and which progress is made very slowly. So, what other question would you like me to answer? You, one thing I'd, uh, I'd like to address in this session about um, uh, discovery, the phases of, de of detection and discovery. Um, you were, um, there's isolation, you have addressed some of those, but uh, isolation and characterization, identification and detection. Uh, when you're doing discovery, I think for researchers they might be interested in that pattern that, that you've addressed. So, well, yeah, the, the, ten the, minutes left. What does discovery mean? You know, uh, Good point. Uh, discovery has has many many several aspects. The original, when I mentioned discovery, they said, "Well, you didn't discover it. It was discovered in 1868, when somebody detected that something was present somewhere." Okay. Well, that isn't that is a, a, a phase of discovery. The next phase of discovery would come about from studying this property and trying to locate where do you find it in tissues. And for example, that phase came when people found, well, you can get it from platelets. It's present in platelets, not in the blood. The next phase of discovery is to isolate it. And then you have it isolated, separated from other things that will interfere with your trying to find out its function. But the but the, the, the real discovery is making it available in some way for everybody to study it. And that only comes from identifying what the material is so it can be made synthetically. Because if, if you can't make it synthetically, you can't isolate it from tissues. There's not enough of it there. You can never isolate it from brain. But once you have the pure material, you can work out methods that then permit you to study its localization. Okay. So the true discovery is identification of structure because then it brings in availability and the possibility of everybody working on it. And the, as a matter of fact, when Abbott and, 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 and Upjohn studied the pharmacology, they didn't come up with anything that was going to be useful. They made a joke of it, for example, I came back with one report. The only thing the pharmacologist found that was interesting is it created erection in dogs. I don't think they pursued that. They might have had one of, one of the newer, newer drugs along that line. But uh, so what they did was they competed with each other to distribute this material around the world. And that is what has made it possible to do these extensive studies that have only led some 40 years later to an understanding of how complex this is, substance is. And it's still growing. There are still more reports because you've got a group of, at least in, in the serotonin club, of 600 members. They're all doing their research on serotonin in some way. It's mostly concerned with uh, drugs that are useful in depression and other disorders like OCD in the brain. But it's still in an active uh, uh, area of development okay. and with 14 receptors uh, and, and, the, and the present extensive knowledge of how complicated the brain is, this will go on for some time. So it all starts with identification of structure which makes the material available. Okay. Thank you. This concludes part one of the interview with Professor Rappard. Thank you. <clears throat> we will take, leave you there. Okay.